tower. We are over the field and turning downwind. Tango later, we still do not have you in sight. Fort Lauderdale Tower, this is Tango Leader. We are over the field and turning downwind. We still do not have you in sight. What's the problem down there? Tango Leader, state your position. We are on base, turning final. That's not possible. We have no aircraft in the pattern. Fort Lauderdale Tower, this is Palm Beach Tower. I think we have four of your birds landing here. Palm Beach Tower, this is Fort Lauderdale Tower. They're all yours. The flight is landing, not at its designated destination, Fort Lauderdale, but 40 miles up the coast at Palm Beach. A strange navigational mistake. One compass could break down. One pilot could make a mistake. But four pilots and four compasses, hard to explain. But no damage was done. That very afternoon, however, another training mission. The five Avengers of Flight 19 would become part of one of the most curious events in the history of aviation. It happened in the Bermuda Triangle. nature of the Bermuda Triangle, the essence of its dark patterns has never been revealed to man. There is one person, however, who may hold a key to the secret. A distinguished author, explorer, investigator of the mysteries of the pyramids and the sea. Deep down there, and mysterious, I'm Peter Tompkins. I spent a lifetime trying to crack some of the mysteries of this universe as a sort of sporting challenge, trying not to get caught. One of the more deceptively tranquil areas of this planet lies within the boundaries of what's known as the Bermuda Triangle. At the dead center of the triangle, I've flown over these stones built into a curious rectangle. A native sponge pen or the submerged remains of a vanished civilization the key to the secret of the triangle.
the apex of the triangle is the British colony of Bermuda, 152 tiny islands stretched over 22 miles of open sea. The 56,000 inhabitants are largely occupied with the care and feeding of some half million tourists that pass through every year. But in this quest, it is just a point of departure. True adventure has no guidebooks. The ocean off Bermuda is a museum of maritime disaster. The encrusted remains of the great and the small, the capsized fishing boat, the torpedoed ship of war. I've seen them before with their gaping holes and snapped spars, open for inspection. But where among these familiar wrecks is the ruin of the cargo ship Catapaxi, last seen in these waters December 11th, 1925? The luxury yacht Revenac, lost en route to a New Year's Eve party in the final hours of 1957. Of a score of other ships, the records show that they must lie here. In fact, they do not, and this is but one corner of the triangle. Another corner of the triangle, a thousand miles to the southwest, at Venerable Vacation Center, Miami, Florida. Its airport moves 12 and a half million passengers a year. They fill a hundred luxury hotels. For them, the Miami Yacht Basin is the jumping off place to the waters of the Caribbean. waters, the 20th century addition to the carnage of the sea. These are easier to find, for the airplane does not drift aimlessly before sinking. It is a dead weight that plunges from its last known position to the ocean floor. Here they join the multitude of rotting galleons, clippers, and steamers that have become a part of the bright coral off Miami. But I find no trace of the U.S. chartered DC-3. The British airliners Star Tiger and Star Ariel, or the five other great airships that were lost here in a single decade. It is not the wreckage, but the absence of wreckage that holds our interest. The ancient Spanish fortress of El Morro which once drove off the Elizabethan sea dogs of Francis Drake, now guards the final corner of the triangle. It is in sharp contrast to the modern city of San Juan on the island of Puerto Rico. A tropical delight, a place seemingly very far removed from elemental danger. Yet just offshore, a victim is wedged like a sentinel between sky and sea. There is no great mystery surrounding the wreck of the Gelderland. These are hard waters. No, it is not the spectacular wrecks that interest me, so much as it is the victims who vanish without trace or reason. Counting only from 1940, more than a hundred planes and ships and over a thousand human beings have set off into the triangle only to disappear, apparently forever. Many of those who live in the pleasant ports that line the edges of the triangle have been touched for one or more terrible moments by forces they've been unable to explain. Not crackpots and publicity seekers, but seasoned professionals down-to-earth men and women, not given to flights of fancy. 
Such a man is Carlton Hamilton, who personally guided over two million aircraft safely into Miami. More than once in all his many years as an air traffic controller, he came into direct contact with forces that even he could not understand. I had 34 years experience in air traffic control and was on duty at Miami International Tower working from midnight until late in the morning. On duty with one other person at the time. The weather conditions was very good that night. In at a C-46, it was en route from Bogota, Colombia to Miami, descending from 8,000 to 6,000. The pilot of this aircraft I had known for quite some time. He was an experienced pilot and had flown that route many, many times. I asked him to report to leaving 6,000 feet. I did not receive this report when I thought I should, and I started calling the aircraft and could not get any response from it. What is your This particular C-46 pilot had the experience to know that if he had the shoreline lights in sight and something went wrong with the aircraft, to maintain a visual contact reference with those lights. Carlton Hamilton, who has always kept meticulous records, still puzzles over the events of that night in 1949. During this particular watch, all communications had been normal. We had experienced no difficulty with any of our radios. There was no trace of the aircraft or any of its cargo that was ever found. My belief is that the aircraft did experience total navigational failure. I believe that this was caused by some type of condition that exists in the so-called Devil's Triangle. Here we have a controller and a pilot, both intimately familiar with electronic phenomena. Yet somehow it failed them that night, and Carlton Hamilton doesn't know how. It is the first evidence of a connection between electromagnetism and the triangle. 27 years later, in the air over Miami, they are exploring other possible explanations. WFTL, you're on the air. Hi, Ray. I've heard that the Coast Guard has actually sighted UFOs coming in and going out of the Bermuda Triangle. Is that true? And what do you think about that? Well, I think people have seen UFOs entering and leaving the water in the area of the Bermuda Triangle. This area is one of the highest concentrations of UFO sightings in the world, as a matter of fact. If the Coast Guard... It is, is the night of April 13, 1975. Ray Smithers, a Fort Lauderdale radio personality, is conducting a hotline show on the Bermuda Triangle. Have to do with the Bermuda Triangle? Interest is obviously intense, and the lines are jammed. But it is not this electric response that makes it the most memorable show in Ray Smithers' long career. Although it was later established the calls were piling up, suddenly no one would be able to get through. Smithers was about to be isolated. His studio was a total vacuum. Let's go to another call. WFTL, you're on the air. Bermuda Triangle, you're on the air. Well, there's no one on that, that line. Let's try Bermuda Triangle, you're on the air. Now those lines are dead. Let's try some other lines, see if we can get some calls on the air. Bermuda Triangle, you're on the air. All right, there's one of you on the program who will understand what I'm going to say. Each and every living thing on this planet has an aura. Is it communication with the millionth council who governs this planet? The area that you are discussing now is the aura of this planet. It is the communicative channel through which the Millionth Council governs this planet. Which council, sir? The Millionth Council. The Millionth? Millionth. A tape of this broadcast was sent to Los Angeles for scrutiny by voice analyst John Hickman. Studying stress variations in speech, he can tell whether a man is speaking the truth. Disappear, but they are in the timeless void. They are all perfectly alive and well. He's showing stress in that paragraph, which is the significant paragraph on anyone going into the area, do not disappear, alive and well, 
And then when he says it's the only area through which the cancel can communicate. In conclusion, the patterns exhibited on the strip chart indicate that this was not a prank or a hoax call, and the caller believes what he is saying. Anyone going into the area, when the communicative channel is open, do not disappear, but they are in the timeless void. They're all perfectly alive and well. It is the only area through which the council can communicate with this planet. A mysterious voice in the night, talking of a timeless void. Such talk could be ignored if it went for a wealth of documentation on strange disappearances. Stepping onto a real ghost ship gives a powerful feeling of interrupted life. Who can explain away the case of the nameless schooner found drifting between Bermuda and the Bahamas on August 20, 1881? Undamaged, fully stocked with provisions, absolutely empty. And there's more. She was boarded by a prize crew from the schooner Ellen Austin. The ships were separated for two days by a storm. When they came together again, the nameless schooner was ship-shaped but the prize crew had vanished. Even more eerie is the story that a second prize crew was placed aboard her, that the two boats stayed within 10 lengths of each other, and that not only the second prize crew, but the nameless ship itself disappeared for good. December 1946, the schooner City Bell sailed out of Nassau with 24 persons aboard. Three days later, she was found drifting at sea, cargo intact, logbook in order, with the personal effects of 24 human beings hanging neatly on hooks. who claim such disappearances are proof of the existence of UFOs. Advocates of these theories maintain that from a sound and stable ship, human beings do not jump into oblivion. They would have to be plucked by some extraterrestrial hand as guinea pigs for a lab in outer or inner space. Controversy is lively between the supporters of these far-out notions and those who support the most prosaic explanations such as sharks or careless swimming or kidnappings by ocean-going pirates. We'll be back in a moment to TNT Saturday Nitro. Return to TNT Saturday Nitro. Oh, Heavenly Father, whose face the angels of the little ones... Some ghost stories may be hard to believe. Others are hard to doubt. The documentation is complete. The witnesses are credible. Jesus Christ, our Lord. O oh God, whose ways are... One such story begins on a summer morning in 1812 in the British colony of Barbados. The body of 10-year-old Dari Chase is being carried to its final resting place in the burial crypt of the Chase family. We therefore commit her body to the ground. But this was not the all-too-common case of an English girl being struck down by a tropical disease. Little Dari Chase had literally starved herself to death to escape, they said, the horrors inflicted upon her by her tyrannical father, the Honorable Thomas Chase. The body of the tragic Dori Chase was carefully placed beside that of an aunt and a baby sister. It was perhaps poetic justice that the next occupant of the vault would be the tyrant Chase himself. The night before the burial, as was the custom, the slaves were sent to open the crypt. It was hard work, 
The slab that covered the entrance to the vault weighed 910 pounds, but the slaves set to it without heavy hearts, for they were about to entomb a hated master. What they saw, however, filled them with terror. Even from his coffin, the dead hand of Chase seemed to have terrible powers. The slaves refused to return to the tomb unless they were led by a man of God. The Reverend Thomas Audison of the Church of England was not convinced. He led them back to show them that whatever they had thought they'd seen was merely some illusion created by the flickering torches. Reverend Audison was not given to superstition. The coffins were rearranged, and that of Thomas Chase joined them in orderly burial. It was obviously the wretched desecration of a Christian resting place by vandals or ghouls. Except for one fact, none of the coffins had been tampered with. Three more times the vault was opened to receive a fresh body, and each time the coffins were scattered at random. The vault was submitted to official scrutiny by the royal engineers. There were no cracks or chips in the wall. So airtight was the crypt that not the smallest insect existed. They probed the firm ground, inch by inch, searching for subterranean vaults or passageways that could explain away the whole thing but there were none. There was not even moisture. The chase vault was bone dry. The slaves were on the edge of revolt. The chase vault was now known as the House of the Living Dead. Father, The governor decided to put a stop to the fear and unrest on the island. The precise position of each coffin was recorded as it was replaced. Nothing was left to chance. The crypt was cemented. The governor would impress his official seal into the wet concrete. If the vault were open, there would be no way to conceal the fact. They would wait one year, and then the governor would dispel the talk of voodoo once and for all. When the year was up, they returned to pry the lid loose. The seal was unbroken. The vault had not been violated. The coffins should be in order. Looking for explanations, there is no evidence of tidal waves or seismic eruptions, but there is one singular fact. Only one coffin never moved. From the musty book of burials came an explanation. One coffin was made of wood. The rest were made of lead. Electromagnetic forces can provide a rational explanation. George Worley was a good family man, dearly beloved by wife and children. Why don't you give your old dad a big hug? One that'll last all the way from Norfolk to Rio and back home again, huh? Mm. It is the strange transformation of this man Just that makes more, the story of the nice Cyclops pertinent to this investigation. It was 1917, the height of the First World War. Single up the lines, prepare to cast off the starboard bows. A dangerous voyage, but it was the captain's mind that would soon be the cause of the greatest concern. He refused to repair a damaged engine. He picked out an ensign as the root of all his trouble and drove the man to the brink of suicide. Without reason, he placed his executive officer in close confinement. Stripped down to a bowler hat and long underwear, he prepared to dock at Rio and take on passengers. Final prisoner boarded, sir. Three charges and destination. 
I am in second class DeVoe, USS Pittsburgh, convicted of complicity in murder, and duly sentenced by court martial to be transported to Portsmouth Naval Penitentiary, where he shall serve 50 to 99 years in penal servitude. Well, after a month on the Cyclops, DeVoe, your 99 years may come as a welcome relief. Escort the prisoner to close confinement. The murderer, DeVoe, was but one of his two new passengers. The other was an American diplomat, Alfred Gottschalk. The two passengers could not have been in more different circumstances, but each would play his part when the fate of the Cyclops was decided. I must say, sir, it's uh, an honor and a pleasure to have a man aboard with culture and education. The ship's crew isn't exactly intellectually stimulating. They would sail at sundown, despite one tragic interruption. Stand by for engine test, boys. Engine test, full propeller. When the Cyclops set sail from Rio, her reputation as a hell ship was established. Already on the voyage south through the Triangle, it was clear that Captain Wally's mind had begun to disintegrate. But it was the return trip through the Triangle which was to give the Cyclops her tragic place in the history of the sea. there was one consolation. They were bound for Norfolk and home. They were in for a surprise. Without explanation or announcement, Wally docked the Cyclops at the British colony of Barbados. He sent containers ashore for replenishing. He required, he said, more food, coal, and money. It later transpired that he had no need for any of it. Wally spent his last day on dry land taking tea at the American consulate. The consul was a reluctant host. He had already heard disquieting rumors. Rumors of an illegal court martial and of an execution at sea. And this is Commander Worley. Well, how did you do, Brock? That afternoon, his last among the living, Wally seemed to revert momentarily to the loving father. But as he listened to the ship's surgeon, the consul later revealed an instinctive realization that the Cyclops was destined for a fate beyond comprehension. When the ship set sail that night, it was noted that she did not fly the traditional homeward-bound pennant. Yet she radioed the British ship vestries that she was on course in good weather. She was never heard from again. The story of the Cyclops has been put together from a variety of sources. Personal eyewitness accounts, maritime registry, U.S. Weather Bureau reports, and the official records of the U.S. Navy. Even the Secretary of the Navy believed the Cyclops still existed, because never in the history of the U.S. Navy has a ship gone down or been in trouble without sending an SOS. Could it have been Wally's erratic navigation that took the ship off course and into the rocks? But 200,000 square miles of sea were searched, and there were no signs of wreckage. Some said it was mutiny, but where do 302 men hide? The Navy investigated every piece of inhabitable land within the Cyclops range, and there were no strangers. Many were convinced it was hijacking. It was known that Consul Gottschalk had pro-German sentiments, and it was discovered that Worley had been born in Germany. 
but captured German records showed no such event. We'll be back in a moment to TNT Saturday Nitro. TNT Saturday Nitro. So much for the Cyclops. It involved a mad sea dog and a heavily laden ship in wartime. But there's another story concerning an aircraft, one of the most rugged and dependable ever built, the DC-3, and an eminently qualified and perfectly sane pilot, Robert Lindquist. The DC-3 is about to complete a chartered flight between two corners of the triangle, Miami and San Juan, Puerto Rico. C-16002, zero, zero, this is Isla Grande, San Juan. You are cleared for landing. The light which indicates that his landing gear is locked is not functioning, but Lindquist is not concerned. His aircraft had been fully inspected only four days earlier. Of the 10,000 DC-3s built between 1935 and 1947, some 2,000 were still flying in 1977. Of all the aircraft of any type ever built, the DC-3 is generally conceded to be the most durable and reliable. NC-16002, Alatore. Manden algen atelier los barrios. Hey, Roberto, why don't you try that again in English? <laughs> this is NC-16002, Tower. Can you have a crew check our batteries, please? It is two days after Christmas, 1948. 29 passengers, all of them Puerto Ricans, home for the holidays, are waiting for Lindquist to refuel and take them back to their jobs in Miami and New York. They have seen their plane land on schedule and are told they will depart as planned in one hour. They are not aware that their aircraft has a problem. As Lindquist suspected, the malfunction of the lock lights was caused by a minor electrical failure. The water level in the batteries is found to be low and he orders that they be topped up. This particular DC-3 had been delivered on June 12, 1936. It had accumulated 28,257 hours in the air, over 12 years without incident. NC-16002, come in, please. I read you. NC-16002, do you read me? I read you, Tom. Do you read me? I'm getting him, but he's not getting me. The aircraft had been taken to the end of the runway to test its radio capability. The local chief of aviation is called to the scene. Linkwist. My receiver is functioning, but the transmitter seems out. Everything else checks okay. I'd like permission to fly. Without two-way radio communication, Lindquist cannot fly on an instrument flight plan. The chief of aviation grants his request to file a visual flight plan. However, on the understanding that he circled San Juan until his batteries are charged sufficiently to permit radio transmission. In the waiting room, the Christmas spirit is rapidly fading. There has been a delay of two hours while the mechanics, the pilot, and the authorities satisfy themselves that airborne transport's charter to Miami meets all reasonable safety standards. Pre-flight inspection. Completed. Fins, locks, and covers. Aboard. Seats and pedals. Adjusted. Parking brake. And set. Gear latch. Latch. Gear and fire panels. Neutral. Pin tab. Set. Fuel selector. And set. Ladies and gentlemen, I am very happy to announce that Airborne Transport's charter to Miami and New York is now ready for boarding. Carburetor heat, cold, five throttles, mixture, set, static air source, normal, radio, off, lights, magnet, fired, off, battery and generator, on, no smoking and, and seat belt, fuel quantity, checked, warning lights, checked, flight attendant report, is received. Okay. Start right engine. <laughs> Start left 
this engine. of the aircraft except the radio transmitter are functioning perfectly on takeoff at 10.03 p.m. Robert Lindquist with 3,265 hours flying time has covered this route many times before. Co-pilot Ennis Till has logged 197 hours. <laughs> Mary Burke of Newark, New Jersey has the indestructible cheerfulness of the perfect stewardess. Oh, how old are your children? Five, seven, eight, ten, eight, twelve. You should have children. Oh, I will someday. I have to go back to work. Ten minutes after takeoff, Lindquist should be flying a holding pattern. But the tower can neither see nor hear him. ¿Dónde está? Hace 10 minutos que está en vuela. NC16002. This is Isla Grande San Juan. Come in, please. Come in, please. NC16002. Come in, please. No puedo hacer contacto con él. Hola. Ah, bien, gracias. Sí. Sí. Gracias, adiós. Lindquist has successfully established two-way communication with the nearby Civil Aviation Authority. He's on his way to Miami. Kingston, British West Indies. Lindquist has been airborne for three hours and should be within range. This is NC16002, en route to Miami, heading 330 degrees, position 30 miles northeast Guantanamo Bay. Can we have a weather update? This is Royal Air Force Base, Kingston, British West Indies. Visibility unlimited, wind shifting from northwest 10 to southwest 10. Over. Roger. You read it in Jamaica. The flight to Miami takes six hours and 45 minutes. The DC-3 carries enough fuel to fly an additional 45 minutes. The estimated time of arrival in Miami is 4.30 a.m. 4.03 a.m., a control center in New Orleans, 850 miles beyond Miami. Hello, Miami. Hello, Miami. This is NC16002, airborne transport charter from San Juan to Miami. It was normal for New Orleans to pick up Miami communications. You can already see the glow from your lights. We should be over you on schedule approximately one half hour from now. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention? Atención, damas y caballeros. We'll be landing in Miami in about 30 minutes. For those of you going on to New York, we would ask that you disembark before you Mary Burke and her 29 passengers were never seen again. 
the DC-3 and all its contents disappeared from the face of the Earth. The only conceivable explanation, a massive navigational aberration. We'll be back in a moment to TNT Saturday Nitro. Tomorrow, starting at noon, Turner Network Television proudly presents The Blues Brothers and Stripes. Immediately followed by The Blues Brothers. It's like a striped sandwich. Tomorrow. Boom, 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 boom. Well, ladies, um, what do you think about our Snackwell zesty cheese crackers? I can't believe you packed all this taste in these adorable crackers. Say, hey, we could use a refill here. Sorry, I have to save some for the other groups. Reduced fat Snackwell zesty cheese crackers. I am not going to get it. Are you okay? Yeah, no way am I going to get it. I'm going to fight it. I'm not going to get it again this year. You don't look so good. When the tough get sick. I've got the flu. The sick get tough with Tylenol flu. With maximum strength flu medicines plus extra strength Tylenol for the flu's tough aches and fever. I am not getting sick. I'm not getting the flu. Got the flu? Get tough on your flu with Tylenol flu. So what's it going to be, Dion? Football or baseball? Both, boss. Both? Both. Offense or defense? Both. Both? Both. 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 Pizza Hut. Meat lovers or stuffed crust pizza? Both. 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 Want it all? Now Pizza Hut offers our lovers line toppings. Meat lovers, pepperoni lovers, or supreme. Piled high in a stuffed crust pizza. So what'll it be, Dion? 15, 20 million? Both. Both. You'll love the stuff we're made of. If you want relief from minor arthritis pain, turn up the heat on arthritis. Just minutes after applying Ultra Strength Bengay, you can actually see the heat. It's the strongest, most advanced Bengay ever, with the heating power of three pain relievers. So turn up the heat on arthritis. Does your morning feel like a workout? Just to get your hair in shape? Why sweat it? Change your routine with Air Moves by Windmere. Now, getting your hair in shape is a breeze. Air Moves lifts your hair, building body and volume as it dries from underneath. Its unique patented oscillator does the work for you. So shape it up with Air Moves and leave the workout for the gym. Air Moves by Windmere. Available now at Sears. At TNT, our winning ways continue. Congratulations to our Cable Ace Award winners. Yes, I, yes, I am the captain of my soul. The cat in the hat. I would never betray you. The slave is guilty. Our movies win the awards, but what we really want to win is your heart. TNT, the best movie studio on television. Bo Bridges as President Richard Nixon. Kissinger and Nixon. See the world premiere tomorrow night at 8 on TNT. Located one mile north of the Meadowland Sports Complex, it's Segovia Restaurant. Come to Segovia to satisfy your appetite for excellent food. For over 15 years, Segovia has offered the finest in Spanish and Portuguese cuisine. Enjoy fresh lobsters of all sizes, thick, juicy steaks, our very own surf and turf special, seafood, and more. Open seven days a week for lunch and dinner, Segovia Restaurant, 150 Munaki Road, Munaki. In the market for new office furniture, there's only one place to call. Executive Furniture on Route 17 in Paramus. From traditional to contemporary. From the corner office to the computer workstation. From the reception area to the conference room. Executive Furniture has it all at discount prices in stock and ready for immediate delivery. Call Executive Furniture today at 1-800-OFFICE-FURNITURE. Executive Furniture, 770 Route 17 in Paramus. 1-800-OFFICE-FURNITURE. That's 1-800-OFFFURN. We think you'll find it's worth the trip. We now return to TNT's Saturday Nitro. Merry Christmas. Hello. Now it is Christmas 1969, also in Miami. Father Patrick Horgan of St. George's Church gets a call from his friend Dan Burak. Pat, listen, I got stabilizers, I got full flotation, and you got God. What more could you want? Okay, I'll see you at the house. Burak, a successful businessman and former hotel owner, uses his cabin cruiser as an island of relaxation. Father Horgan, on the other hand, is nervous in boats, but he knows his friend is a sober, competent, and careful sailor. And the witchcraft has built-in flotation gel in addition to all standard safety equipment. Besides, 
They are only going out to Boy 7 at the end of the breakwater, past government cut, to look at the Christmas lights of Miami. p.m. The cutter was underway at 9.03. It would arrive at Boy 7 at 9.18. The negative sighting was permanent. Burak had been swept from this buoy beyond the range of the most sophisticated search and rescue unit in the world in the space of 18 minutes. He was unsinkable, his radio and his beacon lights were working. If one does not accept the supernatural, the best alternative is the weather. The records of the Miami Weather Office did reveal that a sudden squall had hit that night. It could have blown Burak to sea, but certainly not beyond the reach of the Coast Guard. Weather conditions in the Miami area are unstable, but they are computerized, charted, and understood. The cause of Burak's disappearance must lie elsewhere. If any man should understand the weather, it is Frank Flynn. He now sells real estate near Fort Lauderdale. But for 20 years, he sailed the world as an officer in the Coast Guard. All the experience and knowledge he gained over the years failed to explain away an August night in the Triangle in 1956. This was my first trip into the Bermuda Triangle. At the time of the incident, the weather was absolutely perfect. Sea conditions, flat calm, visibility and ceiling just about unlimited. It was just a joy to be out that particular morning. At approximately 1.30 in the morning, we observed on the radar scope a solid line approximately 28 miles away. We were a little concerned about it at first. It appeared it had a strong resemblance to a landmass. However, a quick check of the navigation equipment indicated that we were right on course, approximately 165 miles offshore. We tracked it, found that it was dead in the water, so we carefully approached it, and approximately an hour and a half later, we got down to about a half a mile from the radar target, and we carefully moved closer to it. We came down to within about 100 yards from it. At that point, we energized the searchlight and found that we were getting reflections off of the mass, and the carbon arc just didn't seem to penetrate the mass at all. We moved even closer to it, again with the searchlight beamed on it, and started a gentle left turn so that we would not encounter this unknown object head on. and we sort of nudged it with the uh, starboard wing. We did this two or three times without incident, so we got back up to uh, normal cruising speed, and we started our entry into the unknown mass. After penetrating, uh, we found 
that uh, visibility was just about zero. Shortly after entering, the engine room called up and indicated that they were losing steam pressure. Well, what was a situation of little concern became a situation of uh, considerable concern at this point. We were down to approximately four knots at the point, decided that we were going to come about and get out of there. As we started our turn, that's when we broke out of the mass. Now, as to what we might have encountered that night, I really have no way of speculating. Over the years after this happened, I talked to many oceanographers. None of these people could shed any light whatsoever on what it might have been. At the United States Navy Ocean System Center near San Diego, Dr. Jurgen Richter and his staff can artificially recreate any radar configuration and describe its origins. They were asked to study Frank Flynn's evidence. What is being shown here is a schematic illustration of what may happen to a radar beam traveling in the atmosphere. We have plotted altitude 5,000 feet against range up to 250 nautical miles. The path a radar beam would take under an atmospheric condition that reflects, refracts energy back to the ocean surface. And it may account for return echoes from the sea surface, which by the unexperienced operator may be misinterpreted as land echoes. This slide shows how a radar scope might look under the atmospheric conditions, changing from a moist, cool air mass to a dry, warm air mass above, whereby the radar signals would go out very, very much further than they normally would. On this next slide, the conditions have become stronger and we see the appearance of these returns from the ocean area, which we call sea clutter rings. These particular type of returns in no way are associated with the presence of fog or clouds um, in this area. No known vapor mass has ever been recorded on radar. So Frank Flynn did not encounter any known vapor. The only other possibility, the sea clutter ring, is a mirage which will always keep its distance. The image on Flynn's radar grew closer as they approached. The simplest conclusion is that Frank Flynn ran into a visible electromagnetic field. The compass is a relatively simple device that points to magnetic north. It's been around for thousands of years. It can be deflected from its proper heading by a piece of metal. But it's a transient effect, and it regains its proper heading. All in all, it's a very durable device that has guided sailors and flyers through the worst of storms. But going through the Bermuda Triangle, compasses have been known to spin like a top, and many of them have never recovered their proper heading. A marine salvage tug, that durable old plow horse of the sea, the last place you'd expect to experience one of the strangest moments in the history of the Triangle. It was a quiet day in 1963. A tug was pulling a barge from Puerto Rico to Fort Lauderdale. The skipper was asleep below when it happened. The compass had become erratic. The captain is a hulk of a man with 30 years at sea. Don Henry is his name, and he'll tell you he's seen it all. I heard a commotion from the crew. I screamed out into the bridge, screaming, what the hell's going on here? And they let me know that uh, the compass was spinning and the gyros had tumbled. The radio uh, communication had gone. The uh, electric generators had stopped. This we found out later. We didn't know at the time. Don Henry had thought he had seen it all. He admitted later that he momentarily lost the psychological bearings that had never failed him before. But he had not yet experienced the most uncanny element of this strange day. I went back to check the tow 
load just automatically. Went below to the uh, towing deck and grabbed the towing hawser. Not that you could pull it because you couldn't, but you could feel if there was anything on the end of it. And it was very tight, like there was something on the end of it. We couldn't see anything. The end of the line was sticking out of the water with nothing on it. The barge had vanished, and yet the ropes were still attached and straining. Henry's only thought was that he and his crew might be the next to vanish. This lasted about, no, I don't know, maybe six, seven minutes. And uh, we got our radio contacts back, we got uh, the radar back, we got everything back. Suddenly uh, the barge was there again, but uh, for that seven minutes we had nothing. Not a sign. Triangle has its share of liars, fools, and charlatans. So one has to rely on the hard-headed old pros, men like Flynn, Hamilton, and Henry. The quest is for natural explanations, not for science fiction. But we were moving in the direction of a solution. Every Halloween, someone always dresses up like these guys. Watch the Blues Brothers tomorrow at noon on TNT. And peace was at hand in Vietnam. But behind closed doors at the White House, the wars raged on. Tune in for the world premiere of the TNT original Kissinger and Nixon, tomorrow night at 8. Fresh. Discover the feeling of fix it and fresh. A stronger, longer hold. A more secure, fresh approach to wearing dentures. And the fresh sensation gives you the confidence to live life without limits. Try a fresh approach. the Norelco lift and cut system shaved closer than ever before. And what do you get? The Norelco razor, our closest shave ever. I told you you can't take this to work. Any teas? No more playing until you clean up your house. I'd like to solve the puzzle. Tomorrow, Dad, now go to sleep. Get the new electronic Wheel of Fortune game, but please, at your age. It could be lights out for America. A total distraction that could lead to total destruction. All you have to do is put all the lights out. With thousands of different puzzles, it threatens to put the entire nation on the plank. It's lights out for America. Hey, who turned the lights out? Wrangler jeans. Available in the two colors boys prefer most. Black and blue. Gene for your 10-year-old son and your 10-year-old husband. Wrangler, real comfortable jeans. Just because a glass and surface cleaner is blue like Windex doesn't mean it cleans glass as well as Windex because only Windex is specially formulated with ammonia D. It leaves a beautiful, streak-free shine. Just about anyone can appreciate. Windex, the best on glass from S.C. E. Johnson Wax. From the biggest who in Whoville to little Cindy Lou, Mr. Grinch, we have our eye on you. Watch Dr. Seuss's How the Grinch Stole Christmas, Wednesday night at 8 on TNT. Watch the big boys of the WCW 100% live on WCW Monday Nitro. Every Monday night at 9 on TNT. You can't get a Taylor's Fit at a department store. You can only get it at Vihan Taylor's. Family owned and operated for over 30 years. Vihan's been the name in custom men's clothing. You'll find quality suits imported from Italy. At Vihan's, you're dealing with the owners, not salespeople. So you can be sure you'll get the best fit. At Vihan's, a custom-made suit is not as expensive as you think. You can get one for about the same price as off the rack. And now, Vihan's has free parking for your added convenience. Vihan's, 60th and Bergen Line in West New York. The only way to detect prostate cancer is through medical examination and screening. Some factors place you at higher risk. Your age, your family history, your ancestry. Get regular physical exams and screenings. If you don't have a doctor, call us for a referral. Because the most frightening aspect of prostate cancer may be what you don't know. 
Live well. We now return to TNT's Saturday Nitro. Just as there are explosions in this universe, there are implosions of energy, where everything is sucked into a mysterious area, and everything is inverted, time and space. We call them black holes, the opposite of what's here, and they're out there, big enough to swallow this whole planet. Einstein sought to explain the interaction of gravity, time, space, matter, and electromagnetics through his unified field theory. In black holes, all of these elements become intertwined to produce astonishing effects. Time runs backwards, space and matter become confused, and the gravitational force is so strong that no light can escape, and thus the black hole becomes invisible. But what if man sought to harness these principles for his own use? Over the years, a number of publications have intimated that in mid-October of 1943, an experiment took place, shrouded in wartime secrecy, codenamed the Philadelphia Project. The experiment was designed to create a strong magnetic field around a U.S. destroyer by means of magnetic generators or degaussers. The field around the ship was to be so strong that the magnetic wavelength those by which we see would be cut. Thus, both the ship and the crew would become invisible. Some claim the experiment did work, driving several of the crew to the brink of mental collapse. Dr. Morris Jessup, who became associated with the Office of Naval Research and who published a small book on the matter, mysteriously committed suicide. The Navy flatly declares that no such project existed. So we do not know from the project if man was able to harness the unified field theory. But it does add corroborative evidence that the mysteries of the Bermuda Triangle could be closely linked with electromagnetic phenomena. In a few hours, these two young people will be dead. They will die alone. But in this particular case, we know what passed before their eyes and diverted them from safety into the sea. It is closely linked with electromagnetic phenomena. June 7, 1969, a beautiful summer afternoon in the Bahamas. Caroline Cassio, a registered nurse from Miami Beach, and a boyfriend are en route to Grand Turk Island. They've just made the last of two fuel stops. They're now on the final leg. Three hours later, Carolyn Cassio calls Caicos Island's control tower. She says she's in trouble. I'm lost, she says. I'm circling two islands, and there is nothing down there. A few minutes later, she called. I'm out of fuel, and I'm sinking. Is there any way out of this? Just a girl, lost and panicky. But how can we explain that just as she was calling the tower, 42 people in front of a brightly lit hotel watched her tiny Cessna 172 circle for half an hour, only 600 feet over their heads. She looked down on this hotel and called it an empty island. She finally broke her pattern and flew away to the open sea and oblivion. The people at the hotel were glad to see her go. The noise of the motor had been annoying. Only the next day did they realize they had witnessed a tragedy.
The search for Caroline Cassio's tiny plane was massive and complete. The Coast Guard station at Miami Beach handles 12,000 distress calls a year, the busiest and most successful rescue center in the world. Pulling in yeah, reference no, to the further. distress that we have. Uh, you have our telephone number. If you do receive any further information, the, please call uh, us. Yeah. Thank you. The uh, last oh, known position is about uh, 60 miles. Coast Guard Cutter Dauntless, this is RCC Miami. RCC Miami, this is the Cutter Dauntless. Over. Uh, Coast Guard Cutter Dauntless, this is RCC Miami. We've dispatched the Coast Guard Cutter Point Barnes uh, to assist uh, the with the outer areas of the search. Over. Coast Guard Cutter Point Barnes, Coast Guard Cutter Point Barnes. This is RCC Miami, RCC yeah. Miami. We've got a report of this aircraft, dark colored Cessna 172, down 60 miles north of Monte Cristo, 100 miles west of Grand Turk Island. Uh, we've got an aircraft en route to that position now, and we're reverting to Dauntless for that area. Seven H-16 seaplanes were standing by to respond to the smallest piece of positive evidence. Given fair warning, they make it almost impossible to vanish. Coast Guard Cutter Dauntless, this is Radio Miami Beach. Request an updated situation report on the Cessna 172. Over. The Coast Guard, with a battery of three cutters, three long-range helicopters, and three huge C-131 cargo planes, searched the area for one week with no success. The massive search for this tiny plane is typical. And yet from 1971 to 1975, 44 vessels simply vanished in the Atlantic. Hijacking was suspected in 27 cases. For the other 17, the Coast Guard admits there is absolutely no explanation. Even more difficult to explain than disappearance was a strange case of reappearance. There are persistent reports that in 1971, a scheduled airliner disappeared off radar coming into Miami. It was gone for 10 minutes, and then reappeared and landed. Could the radar experts explain this event? This is a display that shows for a specific radar whether you can see a target or not. In this case, we have a height range of uh, 2,000 feet and a range of 40 nautical miles. If, for instance, a plane would fly toward the radar at a constant altitude of 500 feet, then we would expect to see it on the radar at a range of about 25 nautical miles. We would continue to see it uh, to about 18 nautical miles. It would disappear then, and it would reappear at 50 nautical miles. This is a pattern which is quite familiar to the experienced radar operator and is quite predictable. And so there is no mystery. The passengers stepped into the familiar surroundings of an airport their flight perfectly uneventful. They did have this one thing in common, however. All their watches were exactly 10 minutes slow. Was the disappearance from radar merely a coincidence? Or did the passengers of this flight become locked for 10 minutes in that strange dimension known as a time warp? triangle and all along what are called the horse latitudes, evidence of electromagnetic forces at work is accumulating. For 20 years I've been studying the Great Pyramid of Cheops on the Giza Plateau in Egypt and from this may come the first inkling of a solution. Whoever built the Great Pyramid understood electromagnetic phenomena. The apex of the pyramid represents the North Pole and encrypted into its dimensions, mathematically, is the gravitational force field of this planet. Edgar Cayce, the prophet, says it was built by Atlanteans. 
And he predicted that in 1968 or 1969, off the coast of Bimini and the Bahamas, a portion of this lost continent would surface. In accordance with Casey's prediction, discoveries were made off Bimini. What appear to be the remains of roads or platforms, huge rocks which strangely resemble other megalithic sites girdling the globe. These blocks of beach rock are so gigantic and are set in such careful geometric lines that many archaeologists believe them to be the work of an ancient civilization as sophisticated as the one which built the pyramids of Egypt and the Americas. Casey attributes these remains to the lost civilization of Atlantis, whose pyramids now submerged, he believes to be an electromagnetic source of highly concentrated microwaves. Microwave is a uh, radio wave, very high frequency, and it's short wavelength. Um, the only natural source we have of any significance is from the sun. What are the dangers? Well, some of these dangers are due to the fact that these short wavelengths, they penetrate the body readily. And for example, uh, when the brain is irradiated, the radiation enters through the skull and gets reflected back and forth on the inside of the skull and irradiates uh, parts of the brain uh, with electromagnetic radiation, and this is an electronic network we have, our neural cells, so that it can interfere with uh, behavior patterns. We'll be back in a moment to TNT Saturday Nitro. For Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger, peace was at hand. But behind closed doors, the war raged on. You tell Henry to talk to no one, period. I did not come to Paris to tell you. I came to end the war. You're the best, Henry. I don't trust him. Run Silver. Bo Bridges. Kissinger and Nixon. See the world premiere tomorrow night at 8 on TNT, the best movie studio on television. With every writing instrument that bears the Parker name, you'll discover a unique blend of classic design, outstanding craftsmanship, and precise engineering. Hallmarks of a pen that is as much a pleasure to use as it is to behold. Did you ever notice how many times a day you look at your watch? More men rely on a watch made by Citizen than any other timepiece. Because more men prefer a watch made by Citizen than any other timepiece on Earth. Citizen. How the world tells time. It's always something. And lots of times, someone you love is right in the middle of it. What they need is a cellular phone from Radio Shack. We have the latest types, the people to answer your questions, and sign you up right on the spot. It's easy, and it shows you care, because who knows what they'll run into out there. Mike? We're gonna be a little late. Radio Shack. You've got questions, we've got answers. Critics call it the new feel-good hit of the season. It's hot and pulsing. It's warm and misty. A must experience for the entire family. Oh! Original shower massage only by Teledyne Waterpick. If you only take one shower this year, this should be it. Coming home for the holidays, it's the Swan Princess. Well done! TV Guide calls it one of the ten best videos of the year. Precisely. This holiday season, bring home the Swan Princess on sale now. See a full family TV event. Watch The Wizard of Oz in concert. Thursday night at 9.30 exclusively on TNT. 
Parkway Toyota in Englewood Cliffs. Your quality Toyota dealer for 29 years has all the new 1995 Toyota fun cars now. Whether you like your fun in sports cars like the nimble and affordable Paseo, the stylish all-new Celica convertible, and the hot, hot Supra, or in a recreational vehicle like the sleek 4Runner, the powerful Land Cruiser, the 1995 and a half Tacoma. You can buy or lease an all-new 1995 Toyota at Parkway Toyota now. Come to Parkway Toyota because we give you more. In the market for new office furniture, there's only one place to call. Executive Furniture on Route 17 in Paramus. From traditional to contemporary, from the corner office to the computer workstation, from the reception area to the conference room, Executive Furniture has it all at discount prices in stock and ready for immediate delivery. Call Executive Furniture today at 1-800-OFFICE-FURNITURE. Executive Furniture, 770 Route 17 in Paramus. 1-800-OFFICE-FURNITURE. That's 1-800-OFFFURN. We think you'll find it's worth the trip. We now return to TNT Saturday Nitro. The information we now have on the effects of microwave bombardments and other electromagnetic phenomena can now be applied to cases long considered closed. A control tower which guided U.S. airmen in World War II. On December 5, 1945, a celebrated drama of the air played itself out in just such a tower as this. It concerns Flight 19, a group of five Avenger aircraft on a routine training mission out of Fort Lauderdale. Of all the events in the Bermuda Triangle, this is the one that most captured the imagination of the public. It also vividly illustrates a startling deviation in human behavior. Marine Sergeant Robert Gallivan has just survived the Pacific War, a veteran of Guadalcanal and Bougainville. Private First Class Yo-Yo Grubel wants to be a priest. It is December 5th, 1945. The Second World War has been over for almost four months. At Fort Lauderdale Naval Air Station, the men are killing time, making plans for Civvy Street. They have just invented the atom bomb. There is no war left to fight. Only Gallivan has much sense of purpose. How long we got, Yo-Yo? This is his last day in the service. I got a little sack time coming. Well, I'm going to spend the rest of my life doing sack time. I'm going to call Mom and tell her to turn down the bed. One last meaningless mission, and he takes the train home to Massachusetts. Hey, uh, we see you gents next war, huh? I don't believe this. <laughs> I plain do not believe this. Devlin, Devlin, Look, you allow the bureaucracy this to get happen, under your skin. Yo, yo, it could relax. happen. Relax, Sergeant. Relax, do corporal. your time, and Back forget about it. Again. Forget about it's those ridiculous. guys, because they don't know. Huh? Isn't that perfect? <laughs> Nothing works, and there's nowhere place. I'm not going to get out of here. It's as simple as that. I am not going to get out of here. I am stuck, lost, gone in some stupid sergeant's file. Hey, look on the... Those who aren't trying to get a discharge are trying to get a little Christmas leave. That's beautiful. Out of the mouth of the budding priest, huh? <laughs> I'm going to die here of boredom. Eagle Bolton, on the other hand, loved to fly. Some of the men didn't like to fly. So in order for them to get their... 50% flight skins, as we call it, extra money for flying, hazardous duty. Uh, they had to have four hours a month of flight time on record. My thing was to fly under somebody else's name whenever I could get away with it for whatever reason was convenient. They had to go on liberty or they needed their four hours or whatever. You flew this morning, you know the regulation. Years later, Bolleton returned to the old air base where he had come within a footstep of losing his life. That afternoon in December, I went out after lunch to fly again in the afternoon. As luck would have it, and that's certainly the word, the duty officer was the same man who had been there in the morning when I had already flown. Since that happening, I've had some thoughts on that subject. One thing I've thought is that my family, which already existed, I 
had one child in Seattle that I had never seen yet. It might have been my entire family had I made that Flight 19. And who knows what else would have been different if, if I'd have flown as the 15th person with that training squadron. The leader of the training squadron was Marine Lieutenant Charles Taylor of Corpus Christi, Texas. He was a six-year veteran with over 2,500 hours in the air, but he was a new man at Fort Lauderdale. He's late, but he's not in any hurry, which is unusual for Taylor, who has a record as a punctual and conscientious pilot. As his crew gathers, a few bets are laid on the pro football final between the Redskins and the Rams. No one will collect. Thirteen men will go up with Taylor in five Avenger aircraft. They are one man short. Corporal Alan Cosner has been excused and Eagle Bolleton has been grounded. They are kept waiting 30 minutes. No. Lieutenant Taylor is trying to get excused from the flight. When asked why, he can't quite explain it. He just feels he shouldn't go. Forget it. Let's go. <coughs> hey, gentlemen. We're sorry for the delay. Gentlemen, you're designated as Flight 19. Uh, the weather's favorable, sea state moderate to rough, service wind 20 knots, gusting to 31. Nothing serious. Uh, your instructor for today is Lieutenant Taylor. For those of you who haven't met him, he's just in from NAS Miami, and he knows the area from hell to breakfast. Chuck? Thank you, Jack. Good afternoon, gentlemen. We will be taking off Naval Air Station Fort Lauderdale at 1410 hours. We will be flying on a course of 091 for 56 miles to Chicken and Hen Shoals, where you chickens will get a chance at a low-level bomb run. <laughs> we'll then continue that heading, 091, for an additional 67 miles. You will then change heading to 346 north for 73 miles. We will then alter heading to 241 west by southwest for 120 miles and return to base. Our ETA is 1723, so you'll be back in time for the early movie. My call sign is FT-28, and I'll be finding the rear position in a tracking formation. Are there any questions? Let's do it. FT-28, your flight 19 is clear for takeoff at 1410 hours. 2.10 p.m. They are 40 minutes late getting underway. 
but they will still be home before dark. Torpedo run goes off as scheduled. They are seen for the last time at 3 p.m. by a fisherman. They were right on course. We'll be back in a moment to TNT Saturday Nitro. Peace. Is it that? Peace is at hand, indeed. Behind closed doors, the wars raged on. Run Silver, Bow Bridges. Kissinger and Nixon. See the world premiere tomorrow night at 8 on TNT. We opened this business 22 years ago. She's obstinate and ornery. She's also my best friend. I guess her hands started hurting her kind of off and on back in March. She worked through it, but she was taking a lot of pills. And I said, honey, why don't you call the doctor? Well, that's who told her about a leave. You take it every 8 to 12 hours. Tylenol, I was taking up to 8 a day. If Advil, I'd take 6. Well, she tried to leave. We did a little math, found out for a whole day's relief, a leave cost half as much as Tylenol or Advil. Anyway, a leave was all she needed. Who knows? Maybe one of these days we'll stop bickering. Don't bet on it. A leave. All day strong, all day long. Next time you go to the dentist, he can improve the way you care for your teeth and gums without drilling or buzzing a thing. And all you have to do is this. Introducing Crest Plus Gum Care. It not only helps fight cavities, it can actually control the bacteria that harm your gums. It's the only toothpaste proven to help get your gums healthier. New Crest Plus Gum Care. It's just what the dentist ordered. Something's been overlooked in the design of women's razors. The woman. But there's one razor that adjusts to your legs and underarms, even bikini line. Norelka Silhouette, the first razor designed to shave a woman where a woman shaves. I wish my son could live a full, healthy life where he felt rewarded and was always learning. Encyclopedia Britannica presents a parent's wish list. I think it's every parent's dream maybe to have a doctor in the family. Every parent has a wish list for their child, and with the help of the new Encyclopedia Britannica, many of those wishes can come true. Encyclopedia Britannica is the finest home learning program in the world. A 32-volume family reference library that will give your child an important advantage all through the school years. To get more information on the new Encyclopedia Britannica, call for this free color booklet now. And just for previewing Encyclopedia Britannica in your home, you'll get this handsome three-volume desk reference set as a free gift. Our wishes are that he just lives up to the potential that he has. Now you can use your home computer to get even more from Britannica. Call now for your free booklet and details about the new Britannica CD. Call 1-800-421-2000. LA Weekly says it's unbelievably hilarious. People Magazine says it makes Ren and Stimpy seem as tame as Muppet Babies. It's Space Ghost, Coast to Coast, and it's only on Cartoon Network, every Friday night at 11. If you don't have Cartoon Network, call your cable operator. We now return to TNT's Saturday Nitro. They should be about to head north.
senior instructor from Lauderdale, Lieutenant Robert Cox, has just taken off on another mission. Cox is about to become the most important man in the lives of the 14 airmen of Flight 19. For the next 45 critical minutes, he will be their only contact with the outside world. Powers, what does your compass read? Repeat to Powers, what does your compass read? I don't know where we are. I'm afraid we got lost after that last turn. This is FT-740 NES Fort Lauderdale. Somebody up here, some boats or planes seem to be lost. This is Fort Lauderdale to FT-74. Roger and acknowledge. Boats or planes calling powers. Please identify yourself so we can send some help. This is FT-28. Does anyone have any suggestions? FT-28, this is FT-74. What is the problem? Both my compasses are out. I am trying to find Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I am over land, but it is broken. I'm sure it's the keys, but I have no idea how far out I am. That is not possible. We're Please instruct FT-28 to fly standard procedure. 270 degrees and fly toward the sun. FT-28, this is FT-74. Put the sun on your port wing, and if you're in the keys, fly up the coast. What is your present altitude? I'll fly south to meet you. I know where I am now. I'm at 2,300 feet. Don't come after me. Roger, 2,300 feet. I'm coming up to meet you anyway. Can you have my Emmy or someone turn on their radar gear and pick us up? We are on a navigational hop, and on the second leg, I took over as I thought we were lost. Unfortunately, both of my compasses are not working. Over. You can't expect to get here in 10 minutes. There's a 30 to 36 knot head or crosswind in your area. Turn on your emergency IFF gear. Or do you have it on already? That is negative. Use your ZBX gear. Use your ZBX gear. FT-74, this is Fort Lauderdale. Tell FT-28 to have one of his wingmen take over the lead. FT-28, this is FT-74. Have one of your wingmen take over the lead. FD-28, your transmission is fading. Something seems to be wrong. What is your present altitude? I'm at 4,500 feet. Visibility, 10 to 12 miles. As the word spread at Lauderdale Base, there was dismay. How could a man with Taylor's experience get lost on such a simple exercise, on such a clear day? Even if his compasses had gone out, it was December, almost Christmas, the days were short, and the sun was definitely in the west. This is FT-74, do you read me? This is FT-74, do you read me? I'm coming in to land. Cox wanted to go back up, but permission was refused. He had played out his part in the drama, and to this day it still ranks as one of the most frustrating experiences of his life. The leader of Flight 19 admitted that he was lost. He at no time indicated he had any other difficulties, except that he believed that his compasses didn't work properly. He asked for assistance in returning to Fort Lauderdale Naval Air Station. And for some 45 minutes, I gave him this assistance by radio. He either ignored or refused the help that was being given him. Fort Everglades to FT-28. If you can change to yellow band 3,000 kilocycle emergency frequency, please do so and give us a call. I cannot 
switched frequencies. I must keep my planes intact. Report over, Glades, to ST-28. Radio check. Affirmative. We have just passed over a small island. There is no other land in sight. I'm at 3,500 feet. Have on emergency IFF. Does anyone in the area have a radar screen that can pick us up? Roger, stand by. Buenas noches, señoras y señoras. Esta noche escuchamos a la musical Got to get him off this channel. We're picking up Havana Commercial Radio. Then a key to all naval and coast guard... All efforts to get Taylor or anyone in Flight 19 onto the regular emergency channel were refused or ignored. We have five aircraft in some difficulty and presumably lost. To all Gulf Sea Frontier and Eastern Frontier, HFDF Nets, please be on the alert to obtain all possible bearings on FT-28, who is transmitting on 4805 kilocycles. We are heading 030 for 45 minutes and then turning north to make sure we are not over the Gulf of Mexico. Over. Port Everglades to Dinner Key. Are you able to get a bearing on FT-28? Dinner Key to Port Everglades. Using radio direction finders, homing in on Taylor's signal, six coastal stations were trying to combine and complete a radio fix on Taylor's position. This is FT-28 to Flight 19. Change course to 090 for 10 minutes. It was later determined that when Taylor had first reported himself lost, he was, in fact, right on course. By now, however, he was hopelessly confused. Port Everglades, this is FT-28. Do you read? I received you very weak. We are now heading 270. Roger, FT-28. This is FT-28 to Port Everglades. We will fly 270 until we hit the beach or run out of gas. Okay, when the first man gets down to 10 gallons of gas, we will all go down together. Does everyone understand? to FT-28. Hear you shrink free, modulation good. At 5.45 p.m., it was dark in Florida. Search aircraft along the coast were on full alert. At Banana River, a flying boat was standing by. The crew didn't know why. Port Everglades to FT-28. Can you change to 3,000 kilocycles? Repeat, can you change to 3,000 kilocycles? At 5.55 p.m., two-way radio contact with Taylor was gone. Five radio centers now had a bearing on Flight 19. They were waiting for Dinner Key, Miami. This is Radio Dinner Key. We've got a good DF bearing of zero, two, three degrees. True from this station. Does that complete the fix? That completes it. Roger. Fix is 29 degrees, 15 north, 79 degrees west. Roger and out. Okay, we found him. Let's bring him home, gentlemen. We've got a fix within a 100 mile electronic radius. 29 degrees, 15 minutes north, 79 degrees, zero minutes west. That's a fix. FT-28, FT-28, this is Port Everglades. This is Port Everglades. Do you read me, FT-28? FT-28. Compasses had gone, a man's mind had gone, and now, just as they had found him, radio contact was lost. Do you read me? Something in the night was terribly wrong. Thirteen more men were about to be drawn into it. At 7.20 p.m., the crew at Banana River finally got word to join in the search. The flying boats were called flying gas tanks because that's what they were. 
It was part of the pre-flight check to make certain that none of the 13-man crew had matches or cigarettes. Roger, Banana River and out. TB-5 airborne from Banana River. This is Dinner Key, informed Banana River has now sent up two PBMs to conduct expanding square search. Taylor to Powers, do you read? By now, the entire Florida coast was this listening to a man die. We are over. Do you think? You should be able to see a light. Do you read me? FT-28, do you read me? The Banana River flying boat was the last hope. She reported in three minutes after takeoff. She was not heard from again. It was later realized that these men too had vanished in total silence, while the last sad fragments from Flight 19 were still being heard. Holding 270 degrees. We did not go far enough east. Turn around again. We just as may as well turn around and go east again. FT-28, FT-28, this is NSO, NSO, how do you read me? Over. It's 8.05. That should finish the fuel supply. It must be down. Despite a monumental search, not a trace of the six aircraft and 27 men was ever found. How could a man of Taylor's experience become so disoriented in an area he knew like the back of his hand? How could the compasses on all five aircraft cease to function simultaneously? And if this was not the case, why did not Taylor give over command to another pilot? If Taylor had a premonition, he was right. It's hard to avoid the conclusion that there was something electric in the air that day. It may have been affecting compasses. It was certainly affecting the human mind. It worked swiftly. It seems to have totally destroyed a fine pilot's judgment. With Commander Worley, the effect was slower a gradual disintegration that built to a crescendo of madness. But why Worley and no one else? Could this not suggest that electromagnetic forces have a focus, a selectivity? With Carolyn Cassio and her companion, it seems to have quite simply affected their optical capabilities, blinding them to reality. It appears to have physically pulled Dan Burak and Father Horgan into oblivion, for Robert Lindquist and his crew, the only logical explanation is a massive navigational fault which did not register either to the eye or to the compass. These are the causes, but what was the final effect? Did they in fact die? How can one be sure? In all cases, there should have been wreckage, and in all cases, there was nothing. further point. Why were the hundreds of other voyagers within the triangle on these particular days left untouched by tragedy? No hypothesis should be discarded. And the most compelling is that of a highly selective electromagnetic force within the triangle with powers beyond our comprehension. Turn to the simple rectangle off Andros, in the heart of the triangle. Archaeologists have noted the similarity of its ground plan to that of the Mayan temple of the turtles in Yucatan. It is made of hand-cut pieces of beach rock, just like that of the Bimini wall. Carbon-14 dating establishes that the Bimini wall was most likely a harbor used by the Phoenicians who sailed regularly through the triangle to Yucatan 2,000 years before Columbus. The Phoenician and Mayan originators of these pyramids in Yucatan are the logical descendants of the Atlanteans whose great hall of records Edgar Cayce prophesied would be found within the boundaries of the Bermuda Triangle. 
It was a misuse of electromagnetic forces which Casey blames for the final sinking of Atlantis. He speaks of submerged pyramids still radiating mysterious waves. Here may lie the secrets of the triangle, even the secrets of existence. So there it is, pyramids, prophecies, electromagnetic anomalies. I plan to stay here in the triangle, diving and digging for clues, however tenuous, geological, archaeological, that might lead to unraveling the mysteries of legendary Atlantis with its fabled pyramids, its resonant crystals, and all the other reputed marvels of a vanished age.